Hello and welcome. Today's topic is communication assessments for individuals with complex communication needs. The Angelman Syndrome Foundation Communication Training Series is made available by the Angelman Syndrome Foundation and a generous grant from the Foster Family Charitable Foundation, a family foundation established in Central California. Today's topic on communication assessment is part of the testing section of the five-step structure that we've been using in this series. Let's just take a look at a couple of webinar outcomes. It's my hope that the at the end of this webinar you will have a better understanding of the features of a good assessment. You will know um, some of the recommended assessment tools appropriate for individuals with complex communication needs. And I hope that you'll have an improved ability to use observation to inform your assessment, as that's going to be part of our training today. Let's go back to the five steps and use that as a framework to talk about communication assessments. We'll start up at the top with targets, or the purposes, intended outcomes, etc. of communication assessments. We'll then go to the second section and talk about how to um, conduct assessments and including the features of good communication assessment. In the tools section we'll identify specific assessments and other resources and their features. Um, the fourth section will cover the content and format of the results of our assessments and then in the last section we'll talk about um, next steps related to the information in this webinar. So let's get into our targets or purposes and intended outcomes of the communication assessment. So that's going to drive everything that comes after that is why are we doing this? Um, if we look at the IDEA um, Part C definition, we see that it states that assessment is the ongoing procedures used by qualified personnel to identify the child's unique strengths and needs and early intervention services appropriate to meet those needs throughout the period of the child's eligibility. Now this is um, from Part C, uh, so it's for the um, early intervention um, group, but the, the definition um, applies as well to our school-age students. Um, and here I have just sort of a gloss that'll help to break down that definition a little bit more to be um, ongoing procedures identifying unique strengths and needs, and identifying services to meet those needs. So that's sort of the um, intended purpose of assessment. If we take a look and combine that definition with other requirements related to the IEP, and then we apply it specifically to communication, we get a picture of a communication assessment that includes identification of strengths and needs, specifically communication skills and abilities, and communication challenges, and then also looking at what's, what successful strategies or methods or approaches um, are there for that student or what contexts or environments might enhance their performance. Um, we also would use assessment to identify services and of course services are connected to our goals and our instructional plan. So assessments should inform all of these um, uh, pieces of our program. When I, when, I, when I think of assessment, I honestly think in a very shortened form, what information do I need to um, inform and improve my instructional program? So what do I need to know about what I'm doing that's going to make instruction better and hopefully outcomes better? Um, okay, so now let's just move right along to teaching and tasks, which um, in this case would be what are the features of uh, a good or a strong communication assessment? Um, and we're going to just start by looking at some of the weaknesses of uh, some assessment protocols and um, how they're administered. This particular list was taken from um, Charity Rowland, uh, a presentation that she did. And she is the, one of the developers of the communication matrix. And she looked at some of the weaknesses that she recognized in many assessments and noted that they often um, accommodated only speech in terms of a response, um, that they don't address the earliest stages of communication 
in sufficient detail to show progress, so they're too gross, um, that they may not probe for meaningful behaviors and instead look for more um, of a production of a behavior. They don't necessarily accommodate sensory or physical impairments, and they can emphasize what the child cannot do. Um, I created a very similar list before I found um, that previous one, so I just sort of piggybacked on that and highlighted a couple of the ones that I really think are the strongest, um, uh, have the strongest impact on um, the assessments and, and um, the quality of assessments that I see. So the first one being um, lack of sufficient detail. So the measurement tools are just um, not matching where the student's abilities are and and so we're missing a lot of information when we apply those tools and also that then lends itself to focusing on um, what the student can't do because you're not getting a good picture. Um, the other piece that I recognize in a lot of assessments is um, that the student may be demonstrating uh, certain communicative functions or um, displaying um, certain skills, but they're in a form that is not necessarily recognized by the assessor. And so that's one of the things we're going to do on the the, um, the latter end of this webinar is to look at some video clips so that we can start to translate some of the actions of our students into actual communicative um, functions and, and assign them meaning um, so that they may be more uh, visible on our assessments. Okay, so let's flip that list around uh, from the weaknesses and focus on what makes a, an assessment a strong assessment. Um, and let's look first at what content we would like to see. So good assessments, um, you would use more than one tool. Um, uh, so not just relying on one specific measure, but using a bunch of different measures. And I think when you see the um, reference list of tools that uh, accompany this webinar, you'll see that there are lots of options available for that. Um, those tools would look at both the forms and functions of communication. So the functions um, are the purposes, so why um, the student might be pr um, expressing something, and then the forms are the how, or kind of what it looks like in what way they, they express that. Um, the, the content would be focusing on the positive or what the student can do. So using tools that um, allow for students to express um, different communicative functions in a range of forms so that that's okay. And then the last um, feature would be having a tool that is appropriately sensitive. So this again relates to that point I was making in the last slide that if you do not have enough detail at the level where the student is performing, um, you won't be able to really get valuable information to inform instruction. It's just going to be the gaps between your measurement points are too great. So what we want to see is that um, list of skills that this is what the student can do and then that juncture of where they start to hit a challenge and then the plus one, because that's going to allow us to describe their present level, then describe where that challenge occurs, and then identify what our goal is going to be. And again, if we don't have enough points along that continuum to look at, then we just it's going to not provide that information for us. So um, we, we want to access a range of sources um, for the content. So talking to as many partners as possible um, is really important, particularly for those um, individuals with the complex communication needs. And, and typically what I'll do is just ask someone to um, talk to me about the way the student communicates, whether it be at school or at home, and I just ask them to you know start talking. And I listen, and I listen in particular for their interpretations. So the example here is, oh, she really loves the book Harry Potter. So 
this is mom's interpretation of something that the student has done that she's now telling me her she's reading it as that her daughter loves the book Harry Potter so at that point I would say tell me about how you know that how does she show you that because that's going to be important information for me to record um, so if mom says well she smiles and she looks at me and she taps the pages and she reaches for the book when it's time to put it away that helps me to know okay when this child shows um, that she enjoys something or she wants something this is how she might express it and so that goes back to that sort of different ways of expressing a function that she may not use words to say I like it but she can use actions to express that same function so I put a pink star by this because this is I have three of them I think on the slides that are um, inserted in places where I find these techniques are particularly effective in getting more robust and detailed information about communication. Um, so I'm hoping that you, if you don't do this, that you might try that. And there's some um, supports in our activity at the end that might help with that. So the next feature of a strong assessment has to do with the context or the sort of the environment of the um, assessment and in general we really want to stick with natural familiar context because that's going to be where our students perform best um, so you might start by looking at say your checklist checklist or tool um, just to remind yourself like what am I looking for um, and that's important because if you don't think about um, the range of things that you might be looking for what functions might I look for or you know just look at those checklists and different um, assessment tools that are on the resource handout and have that available so you're going to be doing some informal observation but you'll also be referencing this checklist or tool so that you it guides your observation right um, you want to observe in sort of typical scenarios at first without intervening so the next slide you'll see what we do when we do intervene but you can get a ton of information um, probably 90 percent of the information that I get um, when I go out and do a needs assessment is just by observing typical routines and I don't do a thing I just observe typical interactions um, if the child is interacting with familiar partners be cognizant of the partner's role and we'll talk about that in a minute too but um, the partner can have a strong influence on um, what the student does or does not do and we have to be careful that we don't attribute that to the student positively or negatively um, be open to a wide range of forms for each function so this is what I was talking about earlier is um, that the way that this child or the student expresses a particular communicative function may look very different than what you expect it's not necessarily um, going to be in words or in pictures so you have to be keen to observe their actions and interpret those as commun communicative functions so translating or explicating what you see and again we'll do some practice with that at the end so you see what that looks like um, engineering opportunities so once you sort of look at the natural context and you observe with your guidance of your um, checklist and your tools you want to go back and say okay what did I not see and why did I not see that um, the, sometimes it is a um, situation where there's lack of opportunity so it's not necessarily a lack of a skill it's lack of an opportunity to express a skill and that can be because there was no naturally occurring opportunity or because the partner took the opportunity so um, I'm trying to think of an example um, if if you wanted to see does this child reject something that they're given and there is no opportunity for anyone to give them anything well I'm not sure if they would reject something that they were given I have to maybe engineer that 
specifically to see what happens, right? So they're just it just didn't happen to come up. On the other hand, um, the other day I was working with a student and the iPad kept pulling up some um, error messages. And I found that I was jumping in and closing out the error messages before I waited to see what the student did. So if I wanted to determine, does the student know to request assistance, I can't tell you whether they do or they don't because the partner intervened. I got in the way of letting him show me what he could do. So being aware of when, one, there was no real um, space or time for that to happen, or two, um, whether the partner um, intercepted an opportunity and didn't give the child a chance to do it themselves, and in, in which case you um, may have to set those items up or um, have the partner back off or something like that. But um, surprisingly, it's a lot of times the case that we don't say um, when we say, okay, the student can't or doesn't do this, um, then when we the next question should be, where did I expect to see that? Where did they have a chance to show me that? And more often than you would think, it's there was no chance to do that. There was no chance to show that. You see that a lot with initiation. People are always, uh, initiations, you know, a big goal that folks want to have. And funny enough, if you watch, lots of times there's there's no real opportunity for initiation. Kids are very directed, particularly in school, with what they need to do, and they don't get to make a lot of choices or act on their own will. So, um, and when they do, it's sometimes not recognized as that. So, when they when they make an um, a move or an action on their own, so um, that's one of those areas where um, working on initiation sounds good, but the reality is sometimes. Um, we inhibit that because we want to kind of keep kids on track. So we have to um, identify, is that truly a goal? And if so, provide some opportunities to work on that. Okay, let's take a look at um, the communication assessment materials and resources. And in fact, I'm just going to direct you to the handout of the assessment tools. Um, these tools are going to focus primarily on the early communication assessment materials. And, and the reason is simply that those are harder for folks to, to find. Um, it's easier when you get more conventional communicators and um, those that are intentional and symbolic, and you can use some of the um, standardized assessments that are adapted for those with those more advanced abilities. But when you get um, the emergent communicators, some folks can find it hard to find a test that would work for that, um, that student. So that's why this handout and this um, presentation is kind of focusing on that because um, it's really an area of great need. Um, so I would like to present a bit of a caution about the um, use of standardized tests, whether it's with um, an emergent communicator or someone with more advanced skills. Um, and this is from the American Speech Language Hearing Association. It should be noted that test scores would be invalid for testing a client who is not reflected in the normative group for the test's standardized sample, even if the test were administered as instructed. However, these tests can provide valuable descriptive information about a client's abilities and limitations in the language of the test. So in my language, most standardized tests were not created for individuals with complex communication needs. So you cannot report a score on a test that wasn't created and uh, normed or um, uh, um, tested on that population. You can, though, use those tests if they're appropriate in terms of their content as one of your assessment tools. And you just have to report the results accordingly. And typically, it's more of an anecdotal report um, and not using... Um, you know, testing measures or age equivalents or things like that. So just um, know that little caveat. Um, and here we have a uh, nice little quote from um, our own Erin Sheldon from her recent book with um, Stephen Calculator, where she kind of concurs with what we've been talking about. Observation-based, descriptive, and portfolio assessment strategies are forms of alternative assessment in naturalistic settings that capture more of the student's 
comprehension and knowledge. So this is what we're talking about is natural environments and it gives us the information that we really want, right? So what do they know? What do they understand? Um, the same as holds true for um, communication. Okay, so let's talk about what we do with the, the results of our communication assessments. Um, the results, no matter how they come in, need to be interpreted. So whether it's a checklist or, um, you know, a, a sample or something, we need to interpret that to determine and share with others what's meaningful about this information. So um, just sort of having it in a list form may not be useful. So part of our, as a professional group, um, if you're an educator, speech pathologist, you need to interpret that and um, determine what is meaningful. As a family member, you would want to ask, tell me about what this means, what we're looking at here. Um, always, 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 we, we can and should focus on the positive, what the child can do and what we're going to do next. There's always always positive there and we just have to choose to emphasize that and not to focus on the negative um, which can be just really um, difficult to to um, you know process and uh, determine what to do with that information and quite honestly isn't very useful so um, you can get the same kind of uh, emphasis on the positive and and the same picture, right? So it's the same student, no matter whether you focus on the positive or negative. So why not just focus on what the student can do? And again, that juncture of where they're challenged and then what they're going to be doing next. Um, also, you can include in your results what kind of changes in the environment or um, the goals or the services might be indicated as that. So if the student functions, you noticed better um, under certain conditions, that's important results of um, the assessment that you could use. Um, what might we do with those results of an assessment? Well, what we could do is um, use that to, just as I mentioned in the, in the latter half of that last slide, provide more supportive context to the student for, communica for communicating. So we may determine that um, the student benefits from more wait time or that the student um, you know, benefits from more modeling or whatever it is that we're doing. So we could build more of that into their program. Um, we might increase opportunities to demonstrate an existing skill. So maybe we noticed once or twice a particular skill or in one or two environments. So now we want to broaden the breadth of that and generalize it to new environments. So it, they have the skill, it's just not as strong as we would like. Um, maybe we want to kind of go in a vertical, kind of um, expanding something that they're doing um, in one form to a new form. So going from um, more um, of a concrete representation or an action-oriented representation to a symbolic representation, if that's appropriate. And then we may determine that we uh, what new skills we want to teach and and we do that by making sure there's an opportunity again that that vacuum um, that space for the child to demonstrate the skill and then that we're doing modeling and we're do, or instruction or teaching them in that moment how to use that particular skill so these are just some ideas about what do we do with the information that we get as a result of testing um, and so it doesn't just live in a report somewhere okay so some potential next steps towards success with our communication assessments. Um, you might want to check out some of the new tests or options from the handouts. Um, you could do some practice observations using videos, which is what we're going to do next. Um, you could do actual student observations using the same structure that we're going to use in the video. Um, you could either request information from the family, or if you're a family, you could supply information about these communicative functions and what you see in this child. Um, you can practice rephrasing can't do to can do um, in your written assessments. Um, and on your next assessment, really emphasize interpretation of information rather than just reporting kind of, um, you know, what you observed, kind of look at what would that be 
um, how useful is that type thing. So just some ideas about how you might want to use the information from this webinar. Um, and another, another quote as we um, transition into our observation is observation-based assessment describes a more complete picture of the child's abilities in areas that should be targeted for instruction. So um, with that, we will transition into our video observation component of this webinar.